Bees are everywhere, all but unnoticed as they fly from flower to flower. They've existed much longer than man, but over the last 8,000 years, man and bee have become partners. In 2006, reports came out of America that millions of bees had disappeared from their hives. It sounds like a science fiction horror film, but it's not. Since the mid-1990s, beekeepers have been reporting extraordinary losses. Everywhere in the industrialized world, bees are dying, and beekeepers don't know what to do. Scientists from many disciplines have mobilized to confront this global problem. In the last four years, what have they learned? Can science provide an explanation, a cure, or a solution? Is it too late to save this tiny creature from extinction? Why should we care? Each year, beekeepers everywhere perform the same spring ritual. On a sunny day, they open their hives to see how their bees survived the rigors of winter. Over the last four years, this ritual has become a nightmare. In Europe and the Americas, beekeepers find losses of 30 to 80 percent. And no one knows why. It's more than just my income. It's. Uh... These are my girls, my bees, so I hate to see, you know, I feel like I let them down some because, uh, you know, uh, obviously we didn't do things right here possibly. We could have done more for them, save them, so it's, uh, it's sad for sure. Like thousands of other beekeepers, Ben Hogan will have no honey harvest this summer. But it's not the loss of honey that has scientists like Bernard Vessier at the French National Institute for Agricultural Research, devoting countless hours to studying bees. Bees are fundamental to the human food chain. Most of our food crops are pollinated by bees, and that includes almost every fruit, vegetable, oil, and nut. L'importance des abeilles dans le service de pollinisation a été très longtemps ignorée. Donc tout d'un coup, on découvre que les pollinisateurs sont extrêmement importants pour la production euh, d'une partie importante de notre alimentation. Il y a 30%, un tiers entonnage de notre alimentation qui dépend de l'activité pollinisatrice des abeilles principalement. Donc c'est quand même considérable. Euh, et ça, jusqu'à présent, on l'a toujours pris pour argent comptant, euh, comme le, le soleil ou, ou l'air. Seeking nectar at the heart of the flower, bees inadvertently transfer pollen to the female organ of the plant. The elaborate beauty of flowers has not evolved simply for our pleasure. It serves to attract pollinators and signals a food source for bees. With fewer bees, crops become less productive, orchards less fruitful, and scientists are asking, What's the fewest bees we can get away with and still have a workable agriculture? It's a question no one would have thought to ask just a few years ago. But there is a global crisis in the making. The agricultural demand for pollinators is growing much more quickly than the supply. In 2006, the danger became clear. Maladies swept through American apiaries. Bees simply started disappearing, leaving empty hives. Scientists name the phenomenon colony collapse disorder, CCD. Alarmed by the sudden threat to the national agricultural economy, the US Congress called on beekeepers and scientists to explain the deadly malady. For a moment anyway, 
the bees had a voice in Congress. May Berenbaum spoke for the CCD Scientific Task Force. Even before CCD, we estimated if honeybee numbers continue to decline at the rates documented from 1989 to 1996, managed honeybees in the United States will cease to exist by 2035. Colony collapse disorder is an unusual phenomenon characterized by the sudden massive disappearance of the majority of workers in a honeybee colony, leaving behind viable brood, or larvae, a small contingent of nurse bees, and a healthy queen and abundant food supplies. Colony collapse disorder progressed inexorably from state to state. Everywhere the same scenario, abandoned brood, abandoned honey, no corpses around the hives. Urgency mounted as a total of 35 states were affected. Scientists suspected a new pathogen, perhaps a newly introduced or mutated virus. One of the early discoveries was a new virus, Israeli acute paralysis virus, which had never been described before in America. And that got a lot of attention. And in that initial screening, there was a relationship that we still see between that virus and CCD. The breakthrough promised a cure, a magic bullet, but hope was short-lived. As a complete explanatory factor, Israeli acute paralysis virus really fell short a few months after that report was released when other investigators went into their freezers, pulled out specimens, and demonstrated that IAPV has been in the US since at least 2002, which antedates the appearance of colony collapse disorder. A dead end. And scientists have had to ask themselves, if this phenomenon might not have a single cause, is it a convergence of several factors? Or is there one primary cause that weakens bees, allowing pathogens to take a heavy toll? For now, it rests just a sudden disappearance of bees, cause unknown. Pesticides have been in vogue, virus diseases have been invoked, cell telephones have been in, in vogue, UFOs have been invoked, all sorts of sort of things. Some of them sensible, some of them just cockamamie. But nonetheless, we really don't know what, uh, what initiates it. The mystery only deepened as reports came in of colony collapse around the world. Massive bee deaths in South America, in Taiwan, in China, in India. Five million bees reported disappeared in just 48 hours in Croatia. And all over the rest of Europe, millions of unexplained deaths. But is it a single illness? Without a recognized cause, it's impossible to say. Summer in Provence is a sun-drenched paradise for bees and beekeepers. But there's trouble in paradise. Even here, bee populations have been steadily and quietly declining for more than 60 years. Everywhere in the world, declines in bee populations have followed the development of industrial agriculture. The post-war world demanded food for a hungry population, and in the name of efficiency and productivity, chemicals and machines were turned to a war against nature. Government policies transformed the landscape to serve the needs of modern agriculture. Hedgerows were plowed under, fields enlarged and leveled. Technicians replaced farmers as agricultural specialists, and beekeepers faced a new challenge as every insect was chased from every flowering crop. Ça a commencé avec le metasystem ox. C'était aux alentours des années 1950. 1950 ou 1960. C'est un produit qui était une violence extrême. Mais là, ça a commencé sérieusement. Depuis, ça s'est jamais arrêté. Autrement, avant, ça n'existe pas. D'abord, il y a beaucoup de petits apiculteurs ou de moyens apiculteurs qui ont arrêté à cause de ça. Et ils ont préféré arrêter. Avant, il y avait énormément de petites exploitations dans toutes les, dans les campagnes. Tout le monde avait trois, quatre, cinq ruches. Ils faisaient leur provision de miel pour l'année. Puis c'était fini. Maintenant, c'est terminé, ça. Fini, ça. 
In the night, when the bees are in their hives, Jean and Remy Brun move their colonies. It's 16 hours of grueling work. Two million bees moved over 200 kilometers from the Camargue to the lavender fields of Provence. Despite heavy stress on the bees, they have to do it twice a year now, both to protect their bees from insecticides and to bring them to fresh flowers. But there is yet another threat for the Bruins to deal with. In the 1980s, a new pest arrived in France, destroying bee colonies and beekeepers. Je vous présente un roi destructeur, c'est un acarien, un acarien qui tue les abeilles, qui tue nos abeilles. Il a été introduit en Europe dans les années 80. Il est présent partout dans les ruches. Il se dissémine extrêmement facilement d'une colonie à l'autre, d'une région à l'autre, etc. Les échanges et le commerce d'abeilles ont favorisé sa progression. Varroa was first seen among bee colonies in Asia. Over the last 30 years, a worldwide market in queens and specially bred bees has spread Varroa into nearly every honeybee colony in Europe, Africa, and the Americas. Varroa is a parasitic blood-sucking mite. It's very small, it's only about two millimeters in diameter, and it fixes onto the bee's body like a crab louse, and it bites the bee and sucks its blood. And in the process of doing that, it, it infects the bee with any viruses that it happens to be carrying. So the overall effect on a bee colony is it weakens the bees and they tend to get viruses. And in particular, the queen who lives a lot longer than the other bees, she tends to be badly affected. Fighting Varroa is trying to kill a bug on a bug. It's hard to find a chemical to kill the mite and not harm the bee. Over time, the chemicals lodge in the wax, diffusing a constant low dosage of pesticide. And in a cruel and vicious circle, the mites become resistant and the bees weaken. But without chemicals, the colony dies. And so the introduction of varroa mite into the country in the 1980s had a real effect on the ability of viruses to get transmitted from colony to colony. And so that's probably what's killing most of the colonies. We usually blame varroa mite, but it's probably the viruses that the varroa mites are, are mediating. On a dans l'ouest de la France mm -hmm. des colonies d'abeilles qui résistent aux varroas sans aucun traitement et qui se portent bien. Et donc on s'est aperçu qu'il y a un mécanisme qui est très fort dans la résistance des abeilles aux varroas, c'est euh, la capacité qu'ont les abeilles de détecter des alvéoles qui contiennent euh, des nymphes parasités avec de la petite famille varroa. Eh bien, quand, les abeilles, quand ces abeilles résistantes détectent la petite famille varroa, elles détruisent euh, tout ce qu'il y a à l'intérieur de l'alvéole. Bees with this remarkable trait of resistance manage to control the population of varroa mites by killing infected poopy and ejecting them from the colony. It's a real form of social cooperation. But how do these resistant honeybees differ from those millions dying from Varroa? Dr. Leconte sent samples to Gene Robinson, leader of the team that sequenced the honeybee genome in 2006. My colleague Yves Leconte in France has identified some honeybees, some strains of honeybees that are more resistant to Varroa than other strains. He sent samples of those strains to my laboratory, and we analyzed their gene activity using the microarray technique to see if we might get some clues about the basis for the resistance. And we were uh, very pleasantly surprised to see that the main differences between the strains that are more resistant to Varroa compared to those that are more susceptible the main differences had to do with activity in genes associated with behavior. Varroa resistance is a collective rather than individual form of immunity. It's called hygienic behavior. Compared to other insects that have been sequenced, honeybees have fewer genes for immunity and detoxification. The individual is by nature weak in the face of pathogens and poisons. But incredibly, 
A strong genetic disposition for social cooperation can compensate in part for this weakness in the individual honeybee's genes. The genes suggest that the resistant strains may be more sensitive to uh, some odors associated with the presence of Varroa. That kind of information can lead to improvements in breeding strategies to be able to breed more resistant honeybees. But is it really quite so easy as it sounds? Artificial insemination is more suited to the laboratory than the apiary. The Tibor Zabos, senior and junior, are commercial queen breeders, and with bees dying everywhere, business is good. Scientists all over the world, they are talking about, yeah, we, we want to breed bees resistant to the mites, or some of them are tolerant to the mites. But how can we get that? Breeding a bee that's resistant to varroa mites is like breeding sheep that are resistant to wolves. Yeah. It, it may be possible, but it's extremely difficult, and we are not sure how. The bees have an incredible reproductive potential, and as long as we can maximize it, we can stay ahead of a lot of its problems. But it's a constant effort. The life of the colony depends on the queen. There's only one. She's the mother of every bee in the hive. Workers feed and groom her day and night and encourage her to lay up to 2,000 eggs per day. She gives off a chemical signal, a pheromone, that calms and coordinates the workers. Should her pheromone weaken or should she stop laying, the workers will raise a new queen. A queenless colony is doomed. The art of the breeder is to trick the worker bees into thinking they need a new queen. There's one in each cage. And we do that because if they could access each other, they'd fight. The queens are worth between $20 and $30 each, depending on the amount that the customer buys. Uh, if they buy uh, over 100 queens here, they're $20 each, so this box would be worth $2,080 to the beekeeper. You could make 104 hives with this one box. The market determines the character of honeybees. Beekeepers favor bees that are gentle and productive, and that's what breeders try to deliver. In North America, just a few hundred breeders supply the hundreds of thousands of queens bought and sold on the continent each year. The result is an increasingly uniform bee population made worse by the fact that honeybees are not native to North America. They were imported by colonists in the 17th century. All the bees share a limited gene pool. Anytime you have a lack of diversity, the population is more likely to be susceptible to diseases or to, to problems. And so we do think that that is potentially one of the things that could be contributing. We don't think it's the cause of CCD or of the decline of honeybees, but as far as honeybees go, it could be one of the weaknesses in, in our population of honeybees. If bees around the world are weak in the face of disease, it's largely due to man. Trying to breed the perfect bee can eliminate traits bees need in order to adapt to a changing environment. Long before man appeared, bees were adapting to local conditions on their own, tuning themselves to their regions. Tough black bees from northern latitudes learned to store more honey in a shorter time to survive a long winter. The aggressive native black bee has learned to live in this harsh Scottish climate through thousands of generations of adaptation. And Willie Robson has adapted his beekeeping to their needs. My father taught beekeeping in the 50s. And I remember my father saying, well, we'll start away and those that die, good riddance. Uh, and from then on, we've worked on, on that principle that if they didn't manage to survive the winter, uh, then that was a good that was a good way to be, uh, and our aim, which is we, what we've achieved, is to have total natural resistance to all the known diseases of bees. 
As Varroa progresses, we'll have to hope that they start to become resistant to that as well. And uh, that probably will occur, not in my lifetime, but within the next 50 years. Uh, the bees are well able to adapt uh, to these sort of things. Using traditional methods, Willie Robson has become one of the largest honey producers in Scotland. The foundation of his philosophy is a simple trust in nature. I think as soon as you start breeding them pure for docility, honey production, uh, you breed out a whole lot of other necessary qualities. And that brings in itself trouble. You know? Once you breed out that, the disease resistant element, uh, you never recover. N that never, never recovers. You, then you re then you're, you're required to put in chemicals to control the disease. There's only a very fine line that you can take when meddling with nature before you get into trouble, you know? And the trouble costs you 10 times as much as you would think, you know? Trouble gets, trouble with anything, any living thing is, is oh, a real headache, you know? In an ideal world, Willie Robson would be a model, but it's too late. If beekeepers everywhere adopted total natural resistance, most of their bees would die. And without this large-scale force of pollinators, the entire agricultural economy would collapse. Tout le monde s'est posé la question, qu'est-ce qui se passe si les abeilles domestiques disparaissent Or, on n'a pas de remplacement actuellement. Un hectare de luzerne en fleurs, un hectare d'amandier en fleurs, c'est plusieurs millions de fleurs qui vont devoir être visitées par des, des abeilles, par des pollinisateurs, pour obtenir une pollinisation optimale. Et ça, on ne peut pas l'obtenir, même avec euh, des colonies de bourdons, même si les bourdons sont plus efficaces que les abeilles domestiques pour certaines cultures, ils ne vont pas pouvoir, une colonie de 50 bourdons euh, lorsqu'elle est livrée, même sans bourdons, par rapport à une colonie euh, de 30 000 abeilles domestiques, euh, bon, on n'est pas du tout au même niveau de population pour réaliser ce travail de pollinisation. Agriculture developed over centuries in an environment with a diversity of pollinators. The domestic honeybee is just one of many bees that visit crops. There are at least 19,000 species of wild bees on the planet, but they're disappearing too. All right, this is a small one. So we've got over 30 species of bees in my backyard, and that's without me spending much time looking for them. Here's a little sweat bee. Declines in wild bees have been documented since 1992, but no one knows the original populations. Different species of bumblebees that used to be fairly common have just gone through the floor. Some of them we can still find in out-of-the-way places, you know, high mountains in Colorado or in, in the northern BC, uh, but we can't find them in places where sometimes they made up 30% of the bees you'd find somewhere. Now they're completely gone. Lawrence Packer, runs the largest wild bee lab in the world. Wild bees are responsible for pollinating most of the wild flowers out there. And so imagine what would happen if all of a sudden the reproduction of wild flowers stopped. There'd be no fruit and berries to feed the birds. There'd be no nuts and berries to feed the bears. The squirrels would be in trouble. The whole terrestrial ecosystem as we know it would be very different if all of a sudden all of the bees disappeared. Some wild bees are very specialized pollinators. They might seek food from a single flowering plant. And if the bee disappears, so does the flower. You see it all the way up there? It resembles a gap, but it's an abeille. An antidium, it's a megachilide. And that's a bourdon terrestre, bombus terrestris. You have another bourdon here. Il y a une diversité de plantes ici à laquelle correspond une diversité d'abeilles. On a une communauté de plantes, une communauté d'abeilles. Si on modifie un élément du système, c'est tout le système entier qu'on modifie. Les deux ont coévolué ensemble et les deux peuvent périr ensemble. Wild bees don't have varroa. They don't have viruses in common with honeybees. 
But something is killing both populations, and the impact of lost pollinators goes far beyond the human diet. For Paul Ehrlich, a founder of the science of coevolution, bees have the task of keeping the world alive. It's very scary to see bees and other pollinators not doing well because they are what are sometimes called mobile links. They move around and connect things in nature. When the things that connect things in nature aren't doing well, that's not a great sign. One of the most important aspects of how evolution works, of how we get the organisms that populate our planet, that support our lives, and that, of course, evolution created us, uh, is not just uh, evolution operating under the pressures created by the physical environment, that is, by cold or uh, winds or something like that, but, of course, other organisms create selection pressures. So that, for example, uh, plants and bees have evolved together over over time so that the bees get their nourishment from the plants and the plants get their sex from the bees. These kinds of co-evolutionary complexes are among the most important aspects uh, of the whole process of evolution. It's not just bees and flowers that evolve together. Co-evolution is a web and it includes one creature that has a critical impact on every living thing man. For the first time in history, the scale of the activities of the human system finally are impinging in a big way on the natural system. And that's why, for the first time in human history, we have the threat of a collapse of a global civilization. In other words, we may go down the drain in part because of the bees. There is a place where all the elements of collapse have been carefully prepared. A place engineered beyond nature, where monoculture has replaced biodiversity. It's an ecology totally dependent on the whim of man. It's called the Central Valley of California at the end of February, when every flower of 700,000 acres of blooming almond trees needs pollination. Over 36 billion bees are needed. It's the world's largest seasonal animal migration. Without bees, wind pollination produces about 40 pounds of nuts per acre. With bee pollination, they produce 3,000 pounds per acre. 60 times more. 80 percent of the world's almonds grow here. If you look at almonds in California, that's the biggest story there is. Um, right now, half of the colonies in the country get moved to California for the almond pollination. By 2012, we expected 86 percent of present-day number colonies to move into California for pollination. Now, if the number of colonies decreases at the present rate, the, every colony in the country, conceivably, would need to be in California for pollination. You know, almonds makes more money for the California economy than grapes and wine do. And so there is that need, that real need for those bees. How do almond growers get the bees they need? They place a call to a cramped and cluttered office on a side street in Bakersfield, California where Joe Trainer has spent 40 years putting beekeepers and orchard owners together. Joe Trainer is a bee broker. Oh, yeah, Frank, yeah, Joey. When I first started in the 1960s, there was enough bees in California to take care of the entire acreage, which was about 100,000 at that time. And uh, the rental fees for bees at that time was about $3 a colony. But since the acreage expanded, 650,000 bearing acres now, uh, there's not enough bees in California to handle that, so we get bees from all over the United States. And uh, it's the transportation cost of, of uh, bringing those bees out to California has driven the price up. It's, it's in uh, anywhere from 130 to almost $200 rental fee now. 
Joe Trainer promises beekeepers a good price for the rental of their hives and promises growers strong hives for efficient pollination. My job is to put the bee in prosperity's path. My job is to identify where she will do best. So I have to kind of think like a bee. I have to think about the resources available. And in, 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 in pollination work, it's, it's a contract. So I'm guided by revenue, enhancing the revenue. Like, you can hear it. Can you hear it? For John Miller, the sound of bees is the sound of money. And we're looking for flight. We're looking for, I want to see what the dancing ladies are doing here. Here, look at this blossom right here. See this guy? He just opened, and the pollen grains are on the right on the end of the flowering parts. This guy is yesterday's blossom, and it's all set. See the difference between this and this? The pollen's been forged and gathered and, and stirred up by the honeybee as she rummages around on the blossom. John Miller is one of a handful of industrial beekeepers who keep their bees in perpetual motion, traveling thousands of miles to pollinate crops all over the country. Some years, we do better in the pollination business. We'll make an income off the almonds. Some of the bees then go to Washington State for the apples. So we have opportunity to get two earning centers, but the apples don't pay nearly as good as the almonds. Then we go to the honey production in North Dakota. Well, some years it's dry, and some years it's wet, and some years it's warm, and some years it's not so warm. It's farming. And you roll the dice every year. You've got to be comfortable with a lot of risk. It's farming. You know, some years are good and some years are terrible. But even a good year can be terrible for the bees. There are stresses of moving, reorientation, sudden changes in diet and climate, infestations, medications. The bees have no chance to adapt. We have to push these hives and we know it. You know, it's the middle of winter out here and we're trying to get those hives to where they're just busting with bees because they then have the strength, the numbers, the capability to, to launch a big flight into a big concentration of flowers, because these trees all bloom at the same time. Bingo. Baby. A migrant beekeeper can make 75% of his income in just three weeks of almond pollination. But to do so, means pushing his bees without limit. As we're maintaining the hives, when we find a hive that's substandard or the queen is failing or missing, we find the old queen, we kill her, and add brood or eggs from another hive, add a new queen to that hive so we don't lose it. With over 600 million bees, Ron Spears is one of the largest beekeepers in the world. Maybe seven to 10 years ago, you could pretty much get two seasons out of them. With the miticides that we're putting in the hives, the constant movement of the hives and the long season that the queen continues to lay, you know, up to 10 or even 11 months in some cases, the queens just get wore out. Um, they, it's, it's stocked just like horses or cattle or anything else, and, and they lose their ability to lay, um, you know, the 1,500, 2,000 eggs that they need need to lay every day to sustain a strong colony of bees. She's up against the screen facing them. She cannot survive without worker bees around her. Ron Spears buys queens from Hawaii, seven to 8,000 per year. With industrial pollination, the honeybee's intimate relationship with place and season is irrevocably broken. The vast monocultures they pollinate are ephemeral and artificial landscapes. Even in the midst of plenty, bees can die of starvation. In a natural environment, many plants flower at the same time, providing a rich variety of pollens with many nutrients. 
But here, bees have little choice. There is but a single pollen. Monoculture of the scale is frequent these days in American uh, farming. Is possible, it's a problem, especially if there's micronutrients that are at low levels or uh, absent from that particular diet of the bees, of pollen of the bees. There can be deficiencies. And so that requires a whole new management scheme of feeding good quality protein, fat, vitamins, minerals. That's a whole new uh, way of managing colonies. We're becoming more and more like a pig farmer, a chicken farmer, uh, in that we're supplying the diet to the animals. We're not really just turning these animals loose into the wild and, and expecting them to pick up adequate nutrition. We're now having to think more like a normal livestock uh, person. This is a hive that's already been treated, and this is a nutritional patty. This is a bag of menthol, and this is Thailand, which is an antibiotic. What pretends to be science at the service of the bee is really science at the service of a system that works bees to death. If the bees have to be fed and medicated, it's because they've been brought into an environment they can never adapt to. They've been tricked, their instincts used against them. You have to feed them to stimulate them, to get them to strength. If you don't stimulate them prior to the bloom coming on, then they aren't strong enough. By the time the bloom does come on, they get strong towards the end of the bloom, but not at the beginning of the bloom. It's just a totally different type of beekeeping, and I don't hold it against them. That is the nature of the business, and every step that that's taken along that line invites trouble. I wouldn't like to be involved. It's not beekeeping. It's just a minefield, you know? Sad, really, eh? All the scourges of the bee are assembled here. Parasites and viruses abound. The rhythm of the seasons has been broken. The earth is saturated with pesticides and fungicides and chemical fertilizers. It's a hell for bees. It was among large migrant beekeepers that colony collapse disorder first appeared. Aggressive management in a terribly degraded environment are among the interacting factors many scientists point to as likely causes. Beekeepers know that colonies can simply lose morale and die. I can't do without the almonds financially, but I think this place is, it's toxic. It's just amazing that they can take those extremes and still be alive. The Central Valley of California is a landscape so extreme as to almost seem another planet. But bees live a nightmare in much more familiar landscapes, like the gently rolling hills of southwest Germany. In May 2008, in Baden-Württemberg, machines planting corn seeds raised a cloud of dust from the dry earth. The dust carried pesticide, scraped off the treated seeds. It settled on apple blossoms and flowering canola fields over an area of 125 miles. 11,500 honeybee colonies destroyed, 330 million bees. Morgens, when we früh morgens to the Bienen gekommen ist, dann waren sehr viele Toten da. Tagsüber haben die Bienen, die die anderen Bienen, diese Toten wieder weggetragen, weil normalerweise eine Biene nicht im Bienenstock stirbt, sondern die machen das wie bei den Indianern. Die, die gehen weg von ihrem Volk, sie gehen in die ewigen Jagdgründe, sie verlassen den Bienenstock zum Sterben. Es gibt nie oder selten, dass Bienen vor ihrem Bienenstock sterben. Das ist immer irgendwie entweder Krankheit oder Gift. Christoph Koch ist one of 700 Beekeepers affected. He lost 70% of his bees. The culprit was Poncho Pro, a pesticide based on the active agent clothianidin. It earns 237 million euros per year for the German chemical giant Bayer. 
Poncho Pro is painted on the seeds of corn rather than sprayed on the growing plant. The treatment was recommended by the regional minister of agriculture, Peter Hawk. This uh, insecticide is against insects, and also against bees. Naturally, very effective. Es ist deshalb als Bienen ungefährlich eingestuft gewesen, weil gebeizter Mais ja im Boden liegt und an den die Bienen ja gar nicht drankommen. Es liegen eben Hinweise vor, denen wir derzeit auch nachgehen, auch in der Frage der Schadensersatzpflicht, dass ähm, Saatgutunternehmen nicht sachgemäß gebeizt haben. Das heißt, das Haftungsmittel, mit dem das Insektizid an das Maiskorn gebunden wird, äh, dieses Haftungsmittel war bei einigen Chargen zumindest nicht in Ordnung. Everything seemed very clear, a simple accident. But in the analysis by the National Laboratory, bees showed doses of clothianidin well below the official lethal level. Wahrscheinlich ist der Wirkstoff doch äh, toxischer ähm, in nur diesen Bedingungen, äh, als man erwartet hat. Aber das muss noch geklärt werden. Clothianidin residue was found in wax and pollen. And the German Food Safety Authority took the extraordinary precautionary step of suspending permission for Pontro Pro seed treatment on corn and canola. Bayer compensated beekeepers 2 million euros for their losses without admitting fault. Nothing more was heard about the unexpected findings in the toxology lab. But on the other side of the border, French beekeepers are certain that this new family of pesticides do kill bees, and not just by accident. Ça a été un très très gros combat des apiculteurs en France, puisqu'on a été en plus le premier pays qui a été touché par ces problèmes-là. D'ailleurs, dans les années 95, 96, 97, on parlait même du mal français des abeilles, et donc on cherchait les causes de nos problèmes de mortalité d'abeilles. Starting in 1994. French beekeepers found their bees dying and disappearing around the sunflower bloom. Honey harvest dropped by 60%. Something had changed. That same year, Bayer introduced a new systemic pesticide for sunflowers and corn, gaucho. It would become its best-selling pesticide ever, worth 556 million euros per year. Beekeepers fought to have the product banned. The battle raged for years. Gaucho is a neonicotinoid, systemic pesticide, like Poncho Pro. A small dose is painted on the seeds and spreads through the body of the plant as it grows. Bayer claimed that the product had no effect on bees. The active agent, imaclopred, didn't contaminate pollen or nectar. But French researchers found toxic residue in sunflower nectar and pollen. And in lab studies, doses as small as three parts per billion affected the bees. Faced with contradictions, the Ministry of Agriculture suspended gaucho on the principle of precaution. Le public a l'impression qu'on n'utilise plus de pesticides. On ne voit plus dans les champs de pulvérisateurs avec des rampes de pulvérisation absolument énormes, ces nuages que tout le monde a vu dans des films, et ainsi de suite. Et donc, on a l'impression que dans nos campagnes, c'est merveilleux, on n'utilise plus de pesticides. Ce qu'il faut quand même réaliser, c'est que ces pesticides ont une toxicité suffisamment importante pour que quelques milligrammes déposés au niveau de la semence suffisent à rendre toxique l'ensemble de la plante, même au stade floraison. Et donc, toute la faune pollinisatrice, hein, là, c'est pas spécifiquement l'abeille domestique, c'est vraiment toute la faune pollinisatrice, dès l'éclosion de la larve, en fait, pendant toute sa vie, va être alimentée avec une nourriture contaminée. But pollen and nectar are not the only plant products contaminated by treatment with neonicotinoids. In 2009, Italian researchers found that corn grown from treated seeds exudes a lethal dose of pesticide in gutation water, a sort of sap. The drops can be up to a thousand times more toxic than the dosage found in nectar. Bees that drink the water die in a few minutes. Bayer counters that there is no proof that bees come in contact with gutation water in the wild. And they claim 
that laboratory experiments, no matter how spectacular, cannot reproduce what happens in the field. French toxicologist Luc Belzance was on the scientific committee that studied the effects of gaucho. He's been testing the latest generations of pesticides for over 15 years. He's made the disturbing discovery that neonicotinoids induce different effects at different dosages. Even extremely low, repeated exposure can have strong, unexpected effects. With these insecticides, there is no safe dose. Il est très difficile de voir des effets comportementaux, par exemple, chez un essai qui est en train de mourir. En revanche, quand on diminue les doses, on ne voit plus le phénomène létal, c'est-à-dire la mortalité, mais on peut commencer à voir apparaître d'autres effets. Et ces effets, on les appelle des effets sublétaux, sub qui veut dire en dessous, et en dessous donc du phénomène létal, c'est-à-dire en dessous de la mortalité. Sur la base de nos études, nous pouvons dire maintenant que le comportement d'un toxique dans un organisme n'est pas forcément celui attendu. Lorsque les doses sont répétées, le toxique n'induit pas une mortalité dans le sens attendu, c'est-à-dire que les, les fortes doses ne sont pas forcément les plus toxiques et qu'on n'est pas forcément protégé par les faibles doses. La question qui se pose maintenant, c'est de se dire si ce phénomène qui a été démontré chez l'abeille n'est pas extrapolable à l'homme. Sublethal intoxication causes nervous disorders, loss of memory, or temporary paralysis. Catastrophic for honeybees and wild bees alike. Is sublethal insecticide poisoning the root cause of disappearing bees? Marianne Frazier's long series of field studies showed that bees are continuously exposed to many agricultural chemicals. And it's not just adult bees that are affected. So the struggle in the beginning was are these things out there to monitor? Are the, bee, are the pesticides there and are they getting into the hive, into the bees' food, into the wax where the bees are developing? That was our original question. That question's been answered. Yes, they are there, they are getting into the hive. In some pollen samples, we found as many as 31 different pesticides. On average, we find six pesticides per pollen sample. It turns out honeybees are quite good monitors of the environment. They pretty much pick up everything that's out there. And while we think we put these things out there and they go away, obviously that's not the case. The honeybee genome revealed that just as bees are weak in immunity genes, they are weak in detoxification genes. They have few defenses against pesticides. The interactions of different chemicals found in the environment are a danger of unknown dimension for bees everywhere, both wild and domestic. We have the evidence that these pesticides, the beginning evidence, that show that these pesticides in combination have a synergistic toxic effect. So two or three pesticides they have together in a pollen diet for the bees have an additive, uh, uh, there's an additive effect of those pesticides. But we're finding that these things, particularly some fungicides and pesticides, can synergize, meaning that they can be much, much more toxic when they're added together than either of these two things are on their own or additively. In the fall of 2009, at Apomondia, the World Bee Congress, the role of pesticides remained controversial. But in the corridors, news was circulating about a breakthrough study demonstrating a new type of synergy. The author was Jeff Pettis of the United States Department of Agriculture. His co-author, Dennis Van Engelsdorp. We exposed whole colonies to very low levels of neonicotinoids in this case, and then challenged bees from those colonies with Nosema, a pathogen, the gut pathogen. And we saw an increase, even if we fed the uh, pesticide at very low levels, we saw an increase in Nosema levels in direct response to the low-level feeding of neonicotinoids as compared to the ones that were fed normal protein. You measured that effect at levels that you could not detect uh, the yeah. pesticides. And so that brings up the question, if, if it's having uh, an effect at that low doses, we wouldn't have discovered it in our study because it was below the limit of detection. The only yeah. reason we knew the bees had exposure was because we exposed them. Otherwise, you would never have known they were exposed. The take-home message is that interactions may be the key. 
So in this case, we're, we're, we're manipulating one pesticide and one pathogen, and we clearly see the interaction. The conclusions of Pettis and Van Engelsdorp were confirmed in a lab study by French researchers Yves Leconte and Luc Belzons, published in December 2009. Even at indetectable levels, neonicotinoid pesticides weaken bee immunity. If this is the final answer to worldwide bee deaths, then the elimination or reduction of neonicotinoids might save the bees. Or is it too late? How can pesticides that poison at indetectable levels be quantified or controlled? How can their elimination be confirmed? Industrial agriculture requires billions of bees, but bees can't live in the environments that industrial agriculture produces. What choice is there, and who will make the choice? For the moment, the answer is simple disposable bees. But science and industry are already working on the future, looking ahead to a world without bees. It's possible to identify forms of genes that would confer uh, specific sorts of advantages and then um, use uh, genetic engineering to uh, put those forms of genes um, into bees. Now, of course, this is a very young science, uh, number one. And number two, um, we have to be very careful with this approach because we know that any gene has multiple functions. There is no gene that just does one thing. The tools are there to produce bees that will be more productive in our agricultural situations, but uh, we need to proceed very carefully. There are possibilities for technological solutions, for some mechanical means of providing pollination services. There may be um, even robotic bees designed if you go far enough in the future. Uh, so I think we have not really exploited the technological possibilities. We really have neglected pollination services. And I think both biolo biologically and technology, many, many options are open to us, and they just uh, require development. biggest problems we face in the world is that in my view and that of a lot of other scientists, we've gone down some wrong roads in our agricultural technology, particularly in over-intensification and spreading very uniform, genetically uniform crops over too much of the planet and not looking at the genetic diversity of crops and overusing artificial fertilizers and pesticides uh, in ways that have just made our problems worse. I, the biggest ecological damage done by humanity overall is through agriculture. Miners once carried a caged canary when they descended into the earth. The death of the bird warned the miners that the atmosphere was dangerous. Bees are much more sensitive to environmental poisons than humans. They too act as environmental sentinels. In the mines, when the canary died, the miners evacuated. Today, beekeepers and their bees are fleeing into cities to escape famine and disease. Ça, c'est un quart de magnifique. Il y a deux, trois kilos. Elles ont très bien travaillé après la première récolte encore. Pourtant, la saison n'est pas favorable. Les abeilles se portent mieux ici, en cœur de ville, que dans les zones de grande culture. Elles produisent plus de miel, il y a moins de mortalité. C'est quand même un vrai signal d'alarme.
on my father's grave, as bees flee home, where laid the treasure, the minutes wing their way by pleasure. These were the words of Robert Burns. As bees flee home, we laid the treasure, the minutes winged their way with pleasure. That was a reference to uh, bees being used for, as a therapeutic uh, medicine for old people and people who, who were recuperating and they sat and watched the bees. And the bees worked all day and the people were happy just sitting watching them. And the bees didn't sting them because they were cottage hives, they were in the gardens, you know. So they were used to people, you know. I'm in the country, the most beautiful countryside. And not only am I looking after bees, but I'm interacting with uh, people in the countryside. So it's, it's all about community, really. And a countryside community and meeting people like shepherds and farmers and landowners and that, uh, as I say, a, a way of life. And I'm the beekeeper. And they have all their jobs as too. And it would be a great pity if all those things eventually collapsed and went away. There's the queen look. Isn't that wonderful? She's frightened. Doesn't like the exposure, you know? Lovely queen, eh? <laughs> 